are so many variations that you can change with candies and that's what's kind of cool about candies in the custom world. Today we're going to specifically be talking about how to paint candy paint. Uh, what we're going to cover is if you have not sprayed candy, what goes into a candy paint job and why do things change, what, what are the differences, and if you have sprayed candy, how do you mat color match a candy. Today we're going to be working on a hood to a, I believe, Plymouth, don't quote me. We've already done all the metal work, we've done all the body work, it's already in primer prepped, and we're going to roll right into this color splotch we have of a brandy wine candy that we are going to figure out how to dissect how many coats that is to be able to blend the hood and make it match the fenders without actually painting the fenders. Now, it will not probably be 110% perfect, but it will probably be pretty dang close depending on how we dissect this candy. But we're gonna get into all the details that you guys need to know today on candy paint. So step one is gonna be spraying your base color. You always have to start with uh, something that's metallic. You don't have to, but it definitely shows the brilliance in the candies. We're gonna be doing, shooting the Orion Max Silver today because that's what we know is already on the car. Now, just because we're spraying Orion Max Silver, you can use a big flake silver, a small flake, you can use gold. It's all going to change the color at the very end. So. That's why this whole process is going to be important to pick what you want because when you're picking a candy paint job and you kind of just sort of know what you want, um, there's so many variations and we're going to get into all the details of why. So stay tuned till the end. We're going to jump right into the silver. Some of the issues that people have when spraying metallics is a few different things. You either guys, you get tiger stripes or you get blotchiness and we're gonna show you guys how to fix that. And this kind of goes really for all metallic paints as a baseline. If you guys don't mix up all your base coat enough, you have everything that goes down and settles at the bottom. But you'll notice that silver is basically clear base coat with just metal flake in it. You can see how transparent it is, and if you don't have the paint mixed properly and you don't spray it properly, you end up with those tiger stripes and see through areas. It is always good to uh, go through these steps in any metallic color. For this one, we're just spraying a hood, but let's say you're spraying an entire car. I like to mix the paint all in one thing. Maybe I don't do it all the same day, but I like to mix it all in one container, already pre-reduced to what I like, and keep it in a separate brand new gallon jug or whatever it is you're gonna store it in. So it is important to document temperatures, mix ratios, all of that stuff. And it's definitely important to go off of a TDS sheet on all the paint that you guys are mixing to know what the mix ratio is and what your times are, your flash times, all that good stuff. Well, we've got the silver all mixed up. There is no more uh, solidity in the bottom. And we have our paint cup on the scale. And you do not have to have a scale, but a scale is nice and important when you're really trying to track things down to exactly what your mixtures were. Because when you're painting a silver and the fact that there's no real pigment, it's just metal flake. If you spray with your gun too far, too close, at an angle, it changes how much of those metallic flakes get heavier and lighter in different areas. So I like to make sure everything is consistent and just so that way you guys understand, this is a two to one ratio for how you mix the, the actual color of the silver with the reducer. And with that, you will see the mix ratios and you'll notice it has two, one, one. And there's other different ratios that you can use for different paints. Today with the silver and with the candy, it's everything's gonna be two to one. So it makes it super easy. You can basically fill on the left here to any one of these lines with the actual silver color. So in this case, we're going to mix it to the number six. And when you put the reducer in, it's going to be 
to the next six. And that is one part versus the two to one. So you just fill up with the six, go to the next six. If you had a hardener, you would go to the next six. If you are confused with how these mixing ratios work, put your cup on your scale, zero it. However much you put of this in, let's just say it says 300, you divide it by uh, two. If it's two to one, you divide whatever that number is that you put in by two. And that's how much reducer you put in. Pretty straightforward. Um, we're gonna mix it up, we're gonna go in the booth, and then we are going to show you guys the pros and cons and tricks to painting metallics. All right, we're in the booth. We've already got our silver into the LS400 Supernova. This is an Iwata gun. What we're using is a 1.4 tip. I like 1.4 tip, it's just what I'm used to. There's a lot of guys that like a 1.3 or a 1.2. Um, really, it doesn't matter unless you're doing a really big flake, then you would have to shoot with a lot bigger tip. So if you're using like straight metal flake and you're using an inner coat, meaning a binder. So inner coat is basically clear base coat and you put the metal flake into it. If you're doing something along those lines, you're gonna want 2.0, 2.5, depending on the size of the flake. You have to make sure that it passes through the gun and doesn't clog. That's number one. Um, but when you're compensating, I feel like any good painter should be able to grab whatever gun and pull off a good paint job. And the reason is gun setup is everything. So when I set up a gun, this is an HBLP, Obviously it's a gravity fed. I like to shoot this gun all the time around 35 to 40 PSI, depending on the paint consistency or the viscosity. When you paint, you need to basically picture your paint gun is like a paintbrush. Everything that you paint onto the panel, this fan is this way for when you're spraying, when these air nozzles are pointed laterally. You can flip this and then the nozzles are going out flat this way. But the real thing that you need to know, I see a lot of guys that hold the gun and they come in and they're just going real fast and they're not really paying much attention to being perpendicular with the panel. Now, why does that play a part, especially with the metallics and especially on a hood like this that has all these curves is we don't have the pigment that we have in a standard color because it's all metal flake. We need to make sure that it has really good coverage. And the other thing that I see a lot is silver colors that look blotchy or they have tiger stripes in them where there's lighter areas. You need to make sure you have enough paint on the panel. It also helps to have your primer if you have it, like we've already got this all sealed and ready to go, but if you had a sealer that's maybe closer to your base color, maybe you're shooting a metallic that's blue, maybe it helps to have a blue sealer that you can tint so that way it doesn't take as much paint to cover. For this instance, it's not going to matter, but what will matter is making sure that your gun is tracking nice and evenly. The whole goal here is that you're putting a coat of paint over whatever panel or substrate to make it look like one perfectly uniform pass over all the crevices. That's gonna become even more critical when we get into candies in a bit, and we'll get over that as well. But your gun fan setup will depict how big your fan is. And when metallics, the number one thing I see people do, and they say, we need my metallics to lay evenly. They don't want those modeling and tiger stripes. So they open the fan all the way up, and they turn the pressure up through the roof to try to itemize it more but you have to really sit back and think about what is the gun doing out of the tip nozzle. Now, if I'm shooting at 35 to 40 PSI and I have my fan open, I always dial them in just one turn so I don't have quite as much overspray, but you need to adjust how much paint comes out of the gun with your needle. That way, every time we talk about consistency on all these videos, when you are painting, you want to be on the air the whole time and you never let up off the air. I don't want to hear the gun doing that bit. You should always be on the air. You have a dual action here on the trigger. Half of it is air and then as you pull back past that, you get the paint. 
you can limit how much paint comes out. Now I say any good painter should be able to pick up any gun and pull off the paint job. Why? Because it's all gun setup. If you take the time in the beginning before your project, don't rush it. Take, take the time to set up your gun, adjust the paint to, maybe it's a bigger tip than you typically use. Well, then you would adjust your paint flow to be less. That way it doesn't just flow out and you have runs everywhere or orange peel everywhere. Adjust it till you get the finish that you desire. And you want a nice, good, wet coat. You don't want a dry coat. Preparation on the panel is also important because everything that we have already done here is done in 600 grit. That also matters. If let's just say you're using 400 grit on the wet sandpaper versus 600 grit, you will see more sand scratches in your silvers and your metallic colors, it, but it won't be as critical with say a white or a red or a black solid color. But the metallics will set into those cracks or, or scratches rather that you scuffed into it. So making sure everything is scuffed really smooth is super important. I don't really like to go above 600 and paint over. Like I don't like to go over 800. I don't feel like it's enough of a tooth. Now, in order to get a nice uniform coverage, we're gonna put three coats to start with of this silver. We're gonna have the gun set up where we like it, so a nice wet coat, but not overly wet, so we have orange peel, and we get our pressure set up what we like. Take a test panel. We're gonna be using a test panel for the majority of this video. As you spray from one end to the other, try to go all the way from one end to the other. If you have a car, you want to go the entire length of that panel. It's important because if you start and stop, you will see those start and stops. Even if you're doing a patch repair with silver and you came in and you just hit the one spot heavily, you will see a halo. You won't see it at the time before you clear, but you'll see it later on when you put it out in the sun. You need to blend out and feather those. So one into the other, you want to maintain about a six inch away um, distance and adjust your gun for your distance as well. You want to adjust the gun for you. Every, just because I adjust the gun a certain way doesn't mean that my guys adjust the gun differently. I try to let whoever it is painting that I'm training to spray at whatever pace they like and just critique the things that you can adjust on the gun to help their speed. You need to be comfortable. So. We're gonna put the mask on. It is very important anytime you guys are spraying to wear protective equipment. If you have the fresh air system, even better. But these are a charcoal filter, and these charcoal filters need to be new within seven to 10 days if they're just open. If you have them in a Ziploc baggie, they will last longer depending on how much you keep them sealed up. But you do need to have good uh, filtration, not only in your garage, maybe it's a box fan, maybe it's a paint booth, but wear your mask, it is important. So if you guys are looking for any of these products, check out the description in this video and we'll attach links so you guys can easily find the products that we're using and talking about. All right, we have sprayed two coats so far on the silver base. And I sprayed two back to back just to kind of amplify so it didn't dry too fast. That when you guys look at this hood, I want you to notice how it looks a little tiger striped and splotchy. And if there is any dust nibs at this point, you can let this fully dry for whatever that flash time is until you can touch it without it leaving a fingerprint in your paint. And you can come in there with 600 grit or 1,000 or whatever and just take out the little dust speck and then come back in and hit it at the end. You'll also notice that we have seam sealed all the edges of this hood to eliminate the dirt that wants to come out of all of the inner structure uh, as we body worked everything. Now, as we get these tire stripes, that's what I really want to emphasize because the majority of the jobs that I see 
we could tweak one little thing with your spray gun and your technique to eliminate this modeling as I call it meaning it has even though we're putting a candy over it everybody thinks that by the time I bury it in candy you're never going to see this stuff well tr candy is transparent and what you want to see is a perfect silver paint job underneath that candy to give it a nice uniform look. If you have something that looks aesthetically not right in the base color, like the silver, gold, whatever it is you're using, it's not going to change when you put something else on top of it. Whether it be a candy or a clear, it does not lay out, it does not change. And that number one thing that you change is your air pressure. Everybody thinks in order to get it to lay out super smooth, we just turn the fan all the way up and we crank the air pressure and we get back here and we dust it till it looks uniform. And that might work, but here's the problem. You spent all this time and money on preparation on your paint job through scuffing it thoroughly and doing your body work, your priming, your wet sanding. And now when you come up here and you turn the air pressure up, you just made the particle itself coming out of the gun a small speck that is a dust. And you're dusting it on. If you're dusting it on, you're not getting the adhesion that you need to make sure that this is sticking really good to your panel. So what happens is you have the sand scratches in your porous surface, you've put two good wet coats on, you're not getting the look you want, and then at the end you dusted it, and when you dusted it, you now have a top third coat that's just kind of sitting up there, it's not really adhering and it's opposite of what you should be doing, what everybody does. Everybody thinks turning it up helps. If you take, as an example, we're shooting this at about 38 PSI right now. If you take your PSI and turn it down between 10 and 15 PSI and don't change any other setting on your gun, it's going to put a bigger droplet. And we'll go over to the whiteboard and show you guys kind of an example, but just as a a baseline, if you turn the pressure down, <coughs> excuse me, you get a bigger droplet, a wetter droplet. And as you put that down, that's what they call the orientation coat. That orientation coat looks funky at first, but I wanted you guys to see how splotchy it looks right now before we actually do that. And then we're gonna show you how it almost gives it a little tiny bit of a hammer tone look because it's a bigger droplet. You just have to make sure you give it extra time to flash off and dry. You want that base coat nice and dry before you roll into a candy or to a clear. This principle applies for all metallic colors. Doesn't matter if you're shooting solvent or waterborne. If you turn the pressure down and put a bigger droplet, the metallics orientate better. Here's the other difference. As you're spraying, you're typically doing about a 50% overlap as you spray each pass. When you do an orientation coat and you dial the pressure back to 10 to 15, you need to be doing like a 75% overlap, very tight overlap so everything looks uniform. I always like to dissect the paint job that we're gonna do by doing all of the hard stuff first. So all of my hard to get edges, maybe it's the bottom edge of the car, the rockers, in the jams, I do all that stuff first. That way at the very end, I can come back over everything with a nice tight overlap in that orientation coat and it makes the whole thing look completely uniform. It needs to look 100% uniform before you go to the next step, whether it be candies or clear. So we're gonna go to the whiteboard and just kind of give you guys a demonstration of what that looks like, but it's pretty self-explanatory. Just to beat a dead horse, this is your spray gun. If you have your air pressure turned up, right, it's a smaller particle that hits the panel as the dust. And as you turn the pressure down, it globs out of the gun, right? Let's pretend you didn't have any pressure to it. You just pulled the trigger, it would just run out. It's a bigger glob. So it's a lot bigger dots that you get when it hits the panel. So if you have a bigger droplet of paint, you need to make sure you give it extra time to flash off. You do not want to be compounding this. Otherwise, if you go to do any of your tape lines, 
it's all going to be wet underneath. Give everything enough time that you can physically touch the base coat and it's not going to smear or cause a fingerprint. Another thing that is critical when you're spraying a car, especially a metallic car, and if you're doing it in panels, maybe it's different days, you need to make sure it's the same painter. Every painter paints at a different level to the panel. If your panel is perpendicular, you get a nice even spray. If your panel is at an angle like this is, more paint is going to be collecting here and this becomes more of a dust. So this being thicker versus thinner will start getting more and more tiger stripes. Consistency through every bit of this process, mixture, temperature, humidity, and the person painting the car is crucial. You need to follow the exact same steps through every single part all the way through. Now that you guys have an understanding of what we're gonna do, we're gonna physically demonstrate it for you on this little test panel so you can see the difference in the texture. So check it out right now. It's nice and smooth. And then we're gonna do the orientation coat. Now when you look at it, it has a different look. It looks a little more hazy. And even though it's hard to see, it will show up more with waterborne colors. And the, I will say this, waterborne paint will, when it flashes and all the moisture is completely out of the paint, it's flashed, it is completely flat. That is one definite advantage of waterborne versus solvent colors. But they act the same as far as how the metallics orientate. So we did a very tight overlap. We turned our pressure down. Now this panel, when you put it out in the sun, is not going to look splotchy or tiger striped. If you get to this point and it is still looking that way, you need to either add more paint or practice your orientation coat. So we're going to mask up. We're gonna do our nice orientation coat over the whole hood. And once everything is completely dry, we're gonna jump into the candies next and go over all those details. Now that we've got all the silver base done, we're gonna roll into the candies and how that works. A can, this is a candy concentrate. And this particular one that we are using is brandy wine. Now, the brandy wine concentrate gets put into an intercoat base coat. And what it is, it's basically clear base coat. It doesn't have any pigment in it yet. We are going to mix this as if we were just doing base coat, which this is a two to one same as the base silver was. So we're going to put this in two parts to one part reducer. And then we're going to add for every one quart of this, we add two to four ounces of candy concentrate. Now, there are so many variations that you can change with candies. And that's what's kind of cool about candies in the custom world is you can have a million different variances Maybe you change the base color like we talked about early, earlier with maybe a gold that made it darker versus silver that made it brighter. And then you can offset that by how many coats of the candy that you use. This is transparent. So as we spray it, you're getting the metallics that your base. And as we layer this candy over it, with every single coat, it gets darker and deeper. So we're gonna mix this up. And you need to keep note, this is just a hood that we're, we're matching. So it's a little bit different scenario than if you're doing a whole car. But if you were doing a whole car, you would want to mix this all up in one nice good batch so it's consistent all the way through. And the other thing is, this is not the UKK. You would have to use a hardener with the UKKs. This one is just like a standard base coat where we can just put it on without a hardener. Um, what we're going to do, because remember, we're trying to match a car that technically isn't here. We're going to match it off of this big old broken chip that we had off the hood when we first got it. And how we're going to do that is if we know per the paint gun that they used at the paint shop that this is a silver base, not a gold base, 
we matched it with our silver. Now we just need to figure out how many coats of this candy it needs to be used to achieve that darkness and that depth look to it. And it needs to be cleared to really be able to compare apples to apples. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the test panel inside and we are going to spray one coat. We're going to let that completely dry. We're going to cover a strip of it with some tape. We're going to spray a second coat and we're going to step that tape down with every single coat that we put on. When we're done, it typically takes five or six coats of candy to make everything look uniform. At the beginning, it starts looking a little splotchy. Um, don't freak out, even though the whole goal is to paint everything as uniform as you can, so that way you don't have areas that are darker. Like, for example, if you're spraying a hood and you're doing the push-pull technique from one side to the other, maybe you wanna spray the hood a different way that you can go fluently all the way through from one side to the other instead of stopping in the center and then picking it back up in the center because now you have more than one coat in the center. So it will be significantly darker. It's not an issue when you're using something that has pigment. Say you're using a, a blue metallic and you're not doing a candy. You could spray everything in pieces and get the same color panel to panel as long as you did everything we talked about with the me metallic orientation and consistency with being the same painter that did the car. However, when it comes to candies, because they're transparent and because every coat makes it darker, you need to spray everything very uniformly. Um, when we get into the booth, we're also gonna talk about how you would spray the entire car versus just a hood and why those costs just completely go crazy on labor because of the differences in candy and why that's important. So we're gonna mix this up, meet you in the booth. We've got the candy in the gun. We're getting ready to do our test panel and you're gonna see after the first coat, things look pretty splotchy. So make sure you go through the panel as evenly as you can, so that way you get even coverage, even distance. As far as the gun setup, I'm using the same 1.4 tip. Now this is the die, it's very transparent. You can totally go to a 1.3, a 1.2, but again, if I put it on and it looks too heavy, way too splotchy, I'll just dial the gun needle to where there's less paint and I'll be just fine. You got two things. You can either adjust your needle or speed up. It's a speed and a feed of the paint, just like machining world terminology. So if you got too much paint, adjust your needle or move faster, one of the two. Or you can change your distance too. But you don't wanna to get too far out because remember, we don't wanna have a dusty, dry coat on top. We want everything to be wet. That way you have good adhesion and nothing delaminating. When it comes to the cost, if you're wondering what is the difference between doing a metallic paint job versus a candy paint job, why does it have such a drastic jump? Let's think about that. If we know every single coat of this candy is darker. Now let's paint the picture in your head. You're doing an entire car all assembled. We have to have it all assembled when we do it. So that way it's the exact same all the way walking the length of the car from headlight to taillight. Well, when you do that, you're spraying in the paint, into the jams of the door if you don't have them masked. And even then, we've already sprayed the silver base. So the best way to make a perfect candy paint job, in my opinion, and my opinion is not the only way, is to spray every single panel in silver base. Put the whole car together and spray the outside of the car. You're going to want to mask off all of the jams so that way none of this candy blows into the jam of the car and makes the door jam darker than the outside. If we know we're gonna get blow by and you don't mask it, then when you take the car apart or you open the door, you're going to have that difference in color between the jam and the outside. So the best way, labor cost, 
is to take the entire car back apart. And then you're going to have to unmask the jam and you're going to be reverse masking it. So you're going to be taking the masking paper from the jam and removing it and masking off the area that is already candy. Now, I'm doing a test panel and it's good to even do like a splotch, something that you know has the same amount of candy on it, shade, and you have to know how many coats you did evenly. And follow that through the jam. Unmask the jam, spray the jam, and when you unmask both at the end, you should have a seamless transition between the candy over the silver into the jam. At that point, you can pull the car back apart again and clear coat everything uniformly. We're gonna spray this test panel and we're gonna start breaking it down into the stripes and how many coats. Something else that's important to be mindful of is distance on when you sprayed first coat and how much you overlapped between coats. Obviously, if I'm doing a 50% overlap, I don't, that's more coats on the panel. So just keep that in mind. Don't overthink this, don't overstress this. I know it's hard to do because this paint is very costly and you don't wanna screw it up and you don't have to redo it again. And there's no real way to fix it. If you screw this part up, you have to redo the base silver and so forth. So just try to be cautious of all of your steps. That's all I'm trying to say. It's been a couple days. We've been letting the bottom of this hood dry in the test panel. Um, as we were doing each one of the stripes, I was gonna take you guys out in the sun to be able to show you this splotch in comparison to how many coats we did. So we've taken this out there and, and it's just so bright with the sun that we have to film it in here. But what you'll notice is the tape has the amount of coats of candy at the top and then we just went through and we made sure between, you wanna check it shaded in the, out of the sunlight and in the sunlight because you're gonna get two very different looks. But we were able to dial in and know how many coats of candy we needed to be able to get that splotch right. And it ended up being six coats of candy to pull off the splotch. From there, once we uh, figured out how many coats we needed on the panel, we then did the six coats on the bottom of the hood and then we can't get the top painted yet because we're waiting for it to dry. So as soon as it gets dry, we'll flip it over and basically do the same process on the top. I hope this uh, showed you guys how to practice doing candy paint, whether you're doing a color match or whether you're doing a complete. Share what you know, continue to learn. We'll see you guys on the next one.